Harvard Divinity School. An Evening with Twinkie Clark, April 10th, 2024. Good evening, everybody. My name is Teddy Hickman Maynard. I am Associate Dean for Ministry Studies here at Harvard Divinity School. On behalf of everyone here at Harvard Divinity School, we welcome you for this wonderful event, an evening with Twinkie Clark, a conversation and recital. A few uh, preliminaries before we get going. I want to let everyone know that this recital and conversation is being professionally recorded. We are live streamed, we have professional photography, and so we are asking that you all refrain from taking your own so that you won't interrupt and interfere with the professional photography. Can I get an amen? amen. All right now, we're watching, okay. <laughs> Second, a few acknowledgements. First, we acknowledge that Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. If you would like to learn more about Harvard's relationship and ongoing conversation with the Massachusetts tribe, and the ongoing work of reparations that we are engaged in, you can go to the Harvard University Native American program, qnap.harvard.edu. We also acknowledge, pay honor and respect to the more than 70 individuals who were enslaved and worked and labored on this campus. We also acknowledge Harvard's legacy of supporting the demonic institution of slavery through financial and intellectual production. Uh, if you would like to learn more about Harvard and our legacy with regard to our support of and ongoing relationship with slavery, you can go to legacyofslavery.harvard.edu to find out more about this history, but also to find out what we are committing ourselves to in terms of reparative action. With that, it is my honor and privilege to introduce the person who brought this all together tonight, a dear friend who I met, I'm not gonna say how many years ago, as we were undergrads running around this campus. I, it is my honor to present to you the Reverend Dr. Sharice Barron. Hey! Sharice. Hey! Dr. Barron. Dr. Barron is an assistant professor in the Department of Music at Harvard University. She is an ethnomusicologist and historian of African American religious culture. She earned her PhD from Harvard University in African and African American studies. Her current book project is called The Platinum Age of Gospel. And it explores contemporary gospel music and illuminates the marked shifts away from previous eras of gospel performance and culture which have defined the last 30 years of the genre. She is also developing a separate manuscript examining intersections of black sacred music and protest in the Black Lives Matter movement. Dr. Barron is an ordained Baptist minister <laughs> and has served in ministry at churches across the United States and in London, England. As a composer and lyricist, she most recently composed the music and lyrics for the play, The Lawsons, A Civil Rights Love Story, which celebrates the life and love story of black civil rights activist and pastor, William Bill Lawson and his wife, Audrey Lawson. The play premiered at Houston's Ensemble Theater in 2002. Won't you please put your hands together for the Reverend Dr. Sharice Barron. We are also so honored to welcome with us um, an esteemed scholar who has come to help uh, and organize this conversation and to gift us with his own musical talents, and that is Dr. Damien Sneed. Dr. Damien, won't you, 
Stand up, let the people see you. Dr. Damien Sneed is associate professor at Howard University. He is a multi-instrumentalist, a composer, a conductor, an arranger, a producer, whose work spans R&B, classical, jazz, gospel, and pop. His honors include a Dove Award and an NAACP Image Award. He has directed music for the Clark Sisters and many more renowned artists. We invite you to look up Dr. Sneed's discography and to enjoy his music. And we are so grateful that you are here with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Damien Sneed. And now it's my distinguished privilege to present the person we are all here for. She is the leader of the American gospel group singer group, the Clark Sisters. She is the big sister of Jackie, Denise, Dorinda, and Karen. She is the mother of contemporary gospel music. She is the queen of the Hammond B3 organ. She is a member of the Hammond Organ Hall of Fame. She is an award winner of Grammys, Grammy Lifetime, Dove, and BMI, Stellar, Soul Train, Black Image, the James Cleveland Lifetime Achievement Award, Black Music and Entertainment Walk of Fame. She is <laughs> Pastor Elbert Clark's daughter. She is Dr. Maddie Moss Clark's baby. She is a singer, songwriter, producer, arranger, musician, music educator, and evangelist. She is the composer of over 350 songs. She is Dr. Al Bernita Twinkie Clark. Somebody put your hands together and give a great Harvard welcome to Twinkie Clark. Thank you, Dean. I thought the Dean was gonna preach there for a minute. I was, I was kind of feeling something. Now, nah, I gotta live up to all that. <laughs> but thank you, thank you so much. Hi everybody, praise the Lord. Um, first of all, I wanna thank, um, and uh, uh, Damien and Sharif can let me know if I'm out of order with this. I want to thank them for the opportunity of coming to Harvard <laughs> University. <laughs> this is my first time, and I'm the only Clark sister here. So, <laughs> so I'm excited. I realize uh, the value of the education that's uh, given here and all the prestigious people that have studied here. And uh, I'm really excited to be sitting in front of, uh, I think, students. Probably more than that, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm very, very honored and privileged. And I, I thank uh, Damien uh, Sharif, especially because I'm the only Clark sister here. You know. <laughs> I got something over them, you know? <laughs> so it's I indeed a privilege and honor. I want to also thank my assistant, uh, who helps me get around. Connie, Connie Yates, wave your hand or stand if you want to. <laughs> Thank you, Connie. She helps me get around. If she wasn't here, I'd be struggling and straining. <laughs> so I'm excited, I'm excited. Just wanna share with you uh, uh, about the ministry of music, how I was taught and trained. And uh, The first song I'm gonna play is influenced by my, my mother the late Dr. Maddie Moss Clark. Have you heard of her? Yeah, yeah she's uh, my greatest uh, influence. And she wrote a song called Going to Heaven to Meet the King. And uh, then I'm gonna go into a, a real old Clark sister song, My Mind is Made Up. This is kind of old traditional style.
repeat. Some of y'all might like that old time stuff. Made up. Right. It is indeed my honor to be here and to uh, witness this historic moment of Twinkie Clark at Harvard University. Yes, indeed. Okay, so I actually have a lot of um, students from my gospel music class and my uh, grad course. If you're from my, one of my classes, can you just wave your hands so Dr. Clark can see you? Yes, yes, all right. And so 
you know, you all had an assignment in my gospel class to take a picture while you're here. So this is a good opportunity to do that. <laughs> if you haven't done it already. If you haven't done it already, and then we'll get back to the rules that um, Dean Hickman Maynard put in place. <laughs> they need it for a grade. They need it for a grade. <laughs> Thank you, I got dispensation. All right, all right. It is just not only an honor to be here with Twinkie Clark, yes, sir. but also with my friend yeah. uh, and colleague, Damian Sneed, who is also just an amazing force in the world. Uh, and you all have a special connection and bond. Can, can you talk a little bit about the work that you have done together? Okay. Well, I met Damian at Howard University uh, when I was studying there. And uh, we just kind of talked about our backgrounds, and uh, later on we found out that, you know, I was related to the Clark sisters, and my mom, the late Dr. Maddie Moss Clark, was my teacher and trainer. And even though Damien finished, I didn't finish, which I regret, but I didn't because I could have gained so much more knowledge and creativity. And then as time went along, um, Damien and I had ended up performing uh, on the same concert and musical church, all of it. And he later on started doing work with my sister, Karen Clark Sheard. And uh, y'all heard of her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll let him tell you the rest. I, I think that's where it began and then Karen made the connection of him working with the Clark sisters. Yes, I first met Twinkie Clark as a student at Howard University and Dorinda and Karen. They all came during my time there and actually had never heard of the Clark sisters before. So I had a lot of catching up to do and she introduced me to her sisters. We prayed together. We performed at the White House together yes, for President did. Clinton and uh, had an opportunity to really uh, glean a lot and learn from her. And what's interesting, uh, when I was working with some friends at Yale University, I see there's some YDS, Yale Divinity School alum out there, I had an opportunity to meet my friend, Dr. Sharice Barron, and you all won't believe this, but uh, Dr. Barron and Twinkie Clark have actually worked together and performed together with my choral group, Corrales Chateau, with Wynton Marsalis and the late uh, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor for an event at the Kennedy Center, uh, Jazz and Democracy, uh, for President Obama's inauguration, and they both were in the choir. And that says a lot about uh, Twinkie Clark, that she was, at that time, a Grammy Award-winning artist, mm -hmm. but she took the time to sing in a chorus mm -hmm. with singers and came to New York City, took care of her own travel and hotel, uh, and rehearsed with us mm -hmm. to perform with us. Uh, Twinkie and uh, Dr. Barron were both in the alto section yeah. for that concert. So it just shows the level of humility for such a great artist who just won uh, Grammy uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, and also for Dr. Barron, who is, uh, I think, one of our uh, world's greatest scholars wow. and a brilliant individual who also plays organ, <laughs> piano, writes music, undergrad from Harvard, computer science. So I'm just honored to be here with these uh, wonderful queens. Oh, Amen. Queens. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say, uh, too, I... Uh, have had the blessing or uh, the challenge of interacting with a lot of famous people. Uh, and I will say these two folks are some of the most kind, caring, um, uh, sociable <laughs> artists you. that you would meet. And so, Bless you. Uh, Twinkie, is it okay if I call you Twinkie? That's fine. Okay, can you say a little bit about your spiritual practice and your spiritual formation. Um, now y'all know, uh, as was already said, I'm ordained Baptist, but I, but I grew up <laughs> holiness. <laughs> All right. <laughs> holiness without. <I'm> <laughs> no, I am. <laughs> Shall see the Lord. Um, and, and I know you come out of a tradition that um, holds to holiness as well. Can you just yeah. talk about your spiritual practice? What makes Twinkie, Twinkie, in terms of how you see people and the world and God? Well, um, I like being around people that love the Lord, 
and enjoy being in the presence of God. And I, like you, I think, were raised with in a strict background. Oh, yes. Uh, my mother, she didn't believe in wearing pants, and we like, what? Now look, this is a new day now. <laughs> she didn't believe in wearing pants, and uh, my sisters would be sneaking and doing it. <laughs> So thank God we finally got past that age. And she also didn't believe that you could really be effective as a singer or musician or writer if you didn't have a, a spiritual life. And um, I remember the time we were getting ready to go on stage. And uh, you know we, we was getting ready to come out of our dressing room like, all right, we're going to tear the house down. And mama stopped us and she said, where y'all think y'all going? Get back in this dressing room and have prayer. And not one time would, out of all the places we've been, even overseas, we have carried on that uh, rule or strictness that she had put in us. And I can remember the times when um, my dad had us go to Bible study and we would be complaining that we had homework. And daddy would say, y'all bring your homework. Bring your homework to Bible study. I, I know y'all got to go to school. Bring your homework to Bible study. So because of that teaching and that training and putting God first in what you do, and also you can't live any kind of life. Mm. You know, you can't uh, call yourself being a choir director and smoking weed. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. That's that's a little controversial. That's a little. <laughs> I think I better stop right there. You know. <laughs> you know, some people. Some people. You know. Holiness. <laughs> Holy Ghost. And maybe, maybe Sharice can help me with that. <laughs> but uh, some some people are so gifted that they're so gifted they're good at it until. You, you know, the people will still go up. It may not be the right spirit. Uh -oh. But you, um, you know, people would get emotional, you know. So we were taught we couldn't do that. We couldn't do that. And um, also, if you want to have the anointing in your writing and uh, in, in your um, ministry of music, then you have to have a prayer life. And um, I think my, um, my most um, precious thing about being a minister of music is, uh, Sharice, that I do take out time to uh, consecrate myself. I go on the fast and I do lots of Bible study. And when I get ready to write a song, then, um, I usually go on a fast and ask God to anoint uh, what he's given me. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Um, let me just say for the students in my gospel music class, we have spent a lot of ta time talking about um, black gospel music culture. And we say we can't really talk about the culture without talking about the theology right. that grounds a lot of gospel music and a lot of it um, is uh, driven by artists like yourself yeah. who, um, or at least a, a big chunk of it, is driven by this, uh, the theology around the anointing. Yeah. Um, so it's great to actually hear you talk about it with unprompted. Yeah. Um, and I also want to say too, that what's so amazing about your practice of prayer and fasting to create the music, it reminds me of the work of iconographers uh, these are people who create the imagery, they create um, images that are used uh, in worship in some Christian traditions. Mm -hmm. And those iconographers also have a practice of prayer and fasting. It's not just getting up and drawing whatever you want to draw, mm -hmm. but there's a process and a ritual that is around that, that, um, that is built around the spirituality and spiritual practice. And so it's awesome for me to hear you talk about it, to talk about your the creation of your music being this kind of uh, spiritual work. And, and I, I 
think you would say that um, it shows why your work has such longevity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you say that? Yeah. Yes. I have a question for you. Uh, in settings like this, people deal with the intersectionality of sacred and secular. Uh, I like to call it the confluence of musical styles. Yeah. Can you talk to us and share, uh, we know your mother was a huge influence on you, yeah. but can you talk about what happened when you were a student at Howard University, particularly about uh, Professor Emeritus Dr. Norris, yeah. and how that was a time, you know, there were some students there that you can mention, like Donny Hathaway right. and Roberta Flack, who you wanted to go there because they were producing a sound, people like Stevie Wonder, Aretha right. Franklin in Detroit, the yeah. Motown sound, yeah. but even classical music. Uh, mm -hmm. Richard Smallwood, who graduated from Howard, uh, is known for his confluence of classical, particularly the Baroque style, and early yeah. classical period in Western music history. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the blend, the mixture uh, of presenting worship to God yeah. through music uh, with that sound. Yeah. But you actually cover classical, yeah. you cover jazz, R&B, hip hop, mm -hmm. but yet you and your sisters have been challenged because people can accept the confluence of the intersectionality exactly. of both sacred and secu secular. Yeah. So could you talk about that in Howard University and the university, universal thought and how that influenced you? Well, at first, um, uh, when the Lord would give me songs, it would be just your uh, basic, um, uh, simple melody. And your style um, was just traditional. But um, with me going to Howard University, uh, my style began to develop. And I started mixing, as you said, all those different styles in the gospel. And uh, that wasn't done much uh, in gospel music. And maybe you and uh, Sharice might hit on it later, but there are a lot of different writers that um, uh, came before my time, and um, they weren't mixing a lot of classical with gospel. And the name you mentioned, Richard Smallwood, was was one of those that the most, not the most powerful, but one of the most powerful writers that had that articulation in mixing uh, classical and gospel. You have to be creative to do it um, with meaning mm -hmm. and uh, effectiveness. Some people try to mix classical with gospel and don't work, it sounds like junk. So <laughs> you have to really be polished and um, uh, professional at bringing the two styles together. So uh, like Damien said, uh, gospel has gone to a whole different level now. People listen to gospel that never listened to gospel before. All over the world. I mean, even Harvard University. <laughs> yeah, that, there was a time gospel music was just nothing. You know, even you could see on the awards, the big awards show, gospel was already played down. But we're in a new era now. So, yes. Damien, mixing all those styles together takes gospel to a whole different level. Mm -hmm. And it reaches more people and it reaches a wider audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of a wider audience and award shows, can we talk a little about, bit about You Brought the Sunshine? Yeah. Which was uh, the classic hit that you wrote that crossed over uh, just in amazing ways. And I think helped to take you around the world if you weren't already going around the world. Took Great you to job. the Grammys, mm -hmm. all those sorts of performing on the Grammy stage. Can you talk a little bit about your inspiration in writing that song? Uh, well, it was, it was inspired through, and I have to be careful when I say his name. I know I'm being recorded, <laughs> but Stevie Wonder, he wrote Master Blaster, and uh -huh. came up with doom, 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 doom. And I said, mm, nobody ever done that in gospel before. So I said, mm, I'm going to try to put some reggae in gospel. And the uh, bass line came, and came to me. So 
So it worked. It, <laughs> yes, it did. That's an understatement. It works. That's understatement of the day. <laughs> and Sharice, I'm glad you asked that question because we got a lot of feedback. Oh. Them pastors, they say, y'all, that music is unholy. And you can't do it in my church. Don't come in here talking about something you brought the sunshine. And what did you say to that? <laughs> oh, don't tell us if it's, if it's too spicy. <laughs> well, I wanted Sharice to continue, continue with that um, subject, but we got a lot of feedback because it was being played in the clubs. Yes. I was waiting on you to say that. <laughs> Absolutely. And it was being played in the bars. Yes. And uh, it crossed over on the secular stations. Right. And we got lots of feedback uh, from the church. They said that we were unholy. Our music was not anointed. It was of the devil. Mm. Yes. And even your mother got some criticism for performing with you on the Grammys as well. But that was really groundbreaking when you all did that in 83, wow. singing hallelujah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, indeed. And now we've come uh, to a new age where it's mm -hmm. totally acceptable. Would you say that? Would you, would you agree with that? Absolutely. So you were really uh, pioneering, really breaking down barriers in your music. Did you ever hear from Stevie Wonder about that song? Did he ever say anything to you about it? Uh, Stevie was impressed. Uh, I'm being recorded. One time. <laughs> He walked up to me one time, Sharice, mm -hmm. at a concert, and uh, I said, Stevie, you give me so much inspiration. And all he said to me, I went up to speak to him, and all he did was, you brought the sunshine, <laughs> and walked away. <laughs> you know, I wanted to meet him and talk to him and tell him that, you know, you inspired me. And he just walked away. Oh, my word. <laughs> <laughs> So I never got the chance to do anything with them. No work, no song. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. It's been over 33 years I've been trying to do some work with him. So I guess before okay. I get too old or before one of us die. Oh, <laughs> Lord forbid. Mm, Lord forbid. Yeah, but I am praying that it happens. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, this is being recorded. We putting it out there. <laughs> we put, hey, hey. Twinkie, uh, as an instrumentalist, I first came to know you by listening to you play. You are truly a multi-instrumentalist. Multi uh, I like to call you a model gene. There's no one like you. Not only do you write like no one else on the earth, uh, the way that you're able to arrange, uh, interpret, bring inside of a spiritual core, and then extrapolate pen to paper and to recording with music, because I know that you had to listen to uh, uh, Freddie Mercury and Queen Bohemian Rhapsody, and now is the time have some similar. Uh -huh, uh, yeah, I hear that. Mm -hmm. So I have a question for you. You actually are a pianist. The recording you did with Ben Tankard and Mighty Fortress is our God. Mm -hmm. Your arpeggios are technically perfect. You're Thank playing you. with nails, which they say classical musicians can't play a, a grand right. piano or Steinway. Right. But you did that in South Africa playing. Uh, greatest thy faithfulness on the piano, your arpeggios, your chords, the voicings, the evenness, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's Cherny or Hannon, I don't know what, whether you did any of that, it's even. Mm -hmm. Then you were using uh, an instrument that was uh, the beacon of technological innovation, the Yamaha DX7 that all musicians were using. You used that on a lot of the Clark Sisters recordings. I did. But then the Hammond B3 organ, which is a, an instrument by Lawrence Hammond in itself, you really know how to create sounds. That's why the rumors I found out are true, that during convocations, they would keep two to three Leslie 122 speakers lined up because the way that you set the draw bars mm -hmm. and the way you usually use all 10 fingers mm -hmm. when you're playing, the Hammond organ and the transistors, the vacuum tubes or whatever, mm -hmm. have not been able to always uh, capture and hold with integrity the sound of heaven that you download from heaven into the earth through the keys, which evokes deliverance and, and worship. But even with the song, Jesus is a love song, when you sang it as a soloist, Karen Clark Shears recording produced by Donald Lawrence, the great Donald Lawrence, finally Karen 
when it was time for your solo, we've all seen the video a million times. You didn't want to sing the solo, you wanted Karen to sing it. Exactly. You kept saying you sing it. So you didn't have time to think. You took a catch breath, for those who understand vocal pr production and the diaphragm. You said, could it be? And then you ended that melisma, or the riff or the run, like a violinist mm -hmm. with their bow at the frog of the violin yeah. wow. set. And you brought it down like this in a moment. You have all of this orchestral uh, gravitas in your palette, in your expression, in your tablets that God gave you. My question is, when I think about Jesus is a love song, when I think about uh, For the Love of the People, the piano intro, da, 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 all of that, when I think about accept what God allows, how are you able, what's your inspiration for your modal interchange, if I come from a theoretical background musically, so beautifully in your compositions, you're able to shift between B flat major and B minor, and you don't just do regular modulations, but you're able to do it modally, and you really are composing like Brahms or like Stravinsky or like Strauss right there at whatever instrument you're at, or even as a vocalist. How do you do that? <laughs> Nobody does that, right? I hope I said it correctly. Please, inquiring minds want to know, how do you do that so well on every instrument? You accompany yourself like it's two people playing. The pedals are always moving separate, like high place. They're not moving with the left hand and the right hand. You did the arpeggio up together and, and synchronously, and then you let the left hand go slower so you get into the right voicing. How do you do all that? That's hard. Uh, <laughs> well, <clears throat> first of all, um, the training I had, I'm not as uh, professional as uh, Damien is as far as classical. Um, the training she gave me was that I had to play hymns. And I said, Mama, I don't want to do no hymns. That's boring. She said, everybody don't like loud, driving, hard music. You've got to learn some hymns. And I started taking uh, classical piano lessons, and I stopped. I just got lazy. So as time went along, with the teaching uh, that I got at Howard University, I said, I'm going to try to mix the classical uh, with gospel. And it, it seems when I started doing it, I, I got inspired to um, do these different um, chord changes and changing keys and um, learning how to execute on the organ, the bass line, um, the Show arpeggios. Us. Show us. The arpeggios and all, all those other uh, terms <laughs> that you said. Okay, he, t he told me to show you. Uh, let's see which one I'm gonna play. I'll do the high place. <laughs> Arpeggios, that's me. <laughs> now, Damien is more of a perfectionist at all those terms he said and doing things like. <laughs> And some gospel mus musicians don't like all that. <laughs> wow. 
but I love it. I love it because, like he said, it takes you to a whole different dimension of music. So uh, I may not be as uh, polished as he is in um, uh, to be the ability to execute um, in different terms, uh, but to mix it all in there together and knowing just how much to put in it now. Sometimes you can overdo it, you know what I mean? So um, he, he's better at it, but I do, I, I do it when we, I ain't supposed to say all this, but anyway, when we do, when we have holy convocation and all the churches come together, uh, we were taught to not only do the hard gospel, the churchy sound. They say shift and change. Mm. You can't be doing no classical stuff with all that now. <laughs> <laughs> you totally killed the spirit. <laughs> that was just amazing. That was just <laughs> amazing. Amazing. All right, so you mentioned convocation, and so we know, or many of us know in this room, that you're part of the Church of God in Christ, Glory. which it, <laughs> we, got, we got some other Church of God in Christ folks in the room, also known as Kojic, yes. and Kojic, or the Church of God in Christ, has been an incubator um, of gospel music. It has been a preserver of gospel music that goes back to... Um, the music of people who were enslaved. I mean, even the music that you just played, which we think of as congregational music, yeah. right? All of that basically was coming from the early um, spirituals, the folk spirituals. Yeah. Um, but also, uh, you all have uh, done so much for gospel music. Thank you. But you yourself have been called, I've heard you called the, the mother of the Kojic sound. Thank God. And I would love to hear you talk about uh, what you see as your impact or um, your legacy in terms of the Kojic sound. And what is the Kojic sound? How would you describe the Kojic sound, your sound, and, and what you did for Kojic? And this is your chance to, to toot your own horn. Okay, okay. Um. Like she said, the congregational songs, that's where it starts. Um, I, well, I just played one with the beat, but I'll, I'll do one. I'm gonna start simple, okay? So don't, don't get bored with me. That's not possible, it's There's not possible. A song my dad used to do, he used to do songs like this, and I, I would say, Daddy, don't, that's so boring, will you stop doing them simple songs? And he would do, um, Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other name I know. And then he might switch up and say, Have you tried Jesus? He's all right. Have you tried Jesus? All right. Have you tried Jesus? He's all right. Have you tried Jesus? He's all right. And then he might switch and say, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier. At our Church of God in Christ convention, that beat right there, the mothers would step out. 
That's slow enough for the mothers to do their little step. And we do it a lot at convocation. <laughs> and then the folks that don't like that slow beat, they pick it up. Yes, show us how they slow it down. Okay. <laughs> when they're ready for him to stop dancing. Oh, yes. when you told me uh, your mother would show you how to roll the bass like someone's preaching. All right, exhorting. Exhort a little bit. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Anybody in here has the Lord been good to you? Say yeah! 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 Woo. We have you too. Preacher Twinkie, mm. singer Twinkie, preacher Twinkie, singer preacher, preacher singer. Can you talk just a little bit about the preacherliness in your singing, especially talk about the growl? The growl, yes. Which a lot of the young people don't know anything about. But, <laughs> but that growl. It used to be a time you couldn't sing if you couldn't growl. Tell us about it, Twinkie. That's good. I don't know if you want to be famous, but I think Karen's a little better at it than me. <laughs> <laughs> but the growl comes from preachers. You know, they, they just have a, uh, an effect that they uh, do in their throat. <sighs> You know, like you're clearing your throat, that same, like she said, growl. You put that with a note. You sing. <laughs> and it, it just gives it some power. 
you know, instead of just singing the notes straight, you put that growling in it. it, it it's, it's like it runs the devil away. It runs them demons away. Especially if it's anointed. And people have, that have been through a, uh, a lot, you know, and suffering, they're the ones that growl the most. I won't mention no names, but uh, Karen is a little better at it than me. But let me see if I can think of a preacher that growls. Um, have anybody heard um, Aretha Franklin's father? Oh, okay. Well, y'all already know this. C.L. Franklin, he, he's one of the best growlers I know. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Can I ask one more question? All right. Um, so we talked a little bit about classical influence. We talked about the folk spiritual, which turns into the congregational songs. Um, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about um, the Whitfield sound and how, if at all, um, it influenced you or you two interacted in terms of music. And Thomas Whitfield, we know, helped to bring a lot of that warm, full jazz sound into uh, choral gospel music. Yes, absolutely. That's kind of hard to come behind. Uh, Thomas Whitfield was in a class of his own, his style. Uh, <coughs> he was known for doing phrasing with the beat, but off the beat. Um, let me see if I can give you an example. I can, I can use the one that he inspired me to write, and that's, I tried him and I know him. And the, the beat is like this. And he would, he would do like a rhythm in his phrasing that is not just the average on the beat. Y'all know what I mean? Yes. Okay. Now, if I were to do it on the beat, it would be like this. I tried him and I know him. But what Thomas would do, he would put like an off rhythm in between it. Like this. I tried him and I know him. Like he's saying a sentence or making a statement, but not on the beat. Found him to be a friend. Now here he comes with the phrasing again. I know too much about him. And the people love it. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> Now we back on the beat. On him my hand depend. That was on the beat. Save my soul. Made me. Now he go off the beat again. There's none like him. There's none like him. Yeah. I feel <laughs> Thomas was one of my greatest inspirations. Oh my word. That's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite songs of yours. Can we just do another little line of that? Will y'all yeah, sing that? Can we line. can we sing that? Yeah. Come on. I try. Too 
much about him. I know too much about him. the dreamers, the painters, mm. uh, those who are entrepreneurs, those who take risks as you have. Mm. We also have our own sufferings. Amen. Our mountains and our valleys. What music do you listen to that becomes your balm when you're going mm. through? Who do you listen to when you need a pickup? Who do you listen to when you need Gosh. healing, when the songs that you've written they bless so many other people, but a lot of times people don't know that sometimes as the creator, the yes. writer, you need the blessing. Amen. You need the, the refilling, the infilling, mm -hmm. again, the refreshing. Yeah. Who do you listen to? Who inspires you? Or who are you listening to now when you need to be refreshed, revived, renewed, inspired? Um, well, um, if we look back at some of the ones that have gone on to be with the Lord, uh, I listen to the Hawkins, um, Andre Crouch, and um, Richard Smallwood's Total Praise, mm. the line, your peace you give yeah. in the time of the storm. That always hits me when I'm going through pain and suffering. Mm. And of course, the old hymns, we talked about that in the congregationals. Um, and I'll name maybe one or two of the Clark Sisters' song. Um, Blessed and Highly Favored, that talks a lot about what you're going through. Um, Praying Spirit, mm. the song the Lord gave me that um, takes me into the presence of God, yes. which helps to take away the pain and the suffering that you're going through. And... Um, Think of uh, one more. I, I like, I think his name is Lamar Campbell, yes. more yes. than anything. Yes. Yeah. I love you, Jesus. Yes. You know, yes. just totally let go. I worship and Play adore. Play that for us. Play that. I love Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. 
just kind of let help you let go of your frustration. I worship you even though I'm going through. One more time. Somebody may be de depressed, but we, we bind that spirit right now. We, we love on Jesus anyway. see somebody crying. Let's say it one more time for them. Oh, I love you. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you. Stop me if I'm, if I'm running out of time. Let's just do it one more time. I love you. I love you, Jesus. I worship. I worship and adore you. Just want to just tell. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. takes me there every time then. I feel like we should let Twinkie play the organ. Can we do that? All right. Twinkie Clark. Okay. Okay, I had on my list, even though the spirit took us in a whole different direction. I'll just play a little bit of what was on my list. The first one is a hymn, A Mighty Fortress. <laughs> Some of you might have heard this. Uh, you can't tell it. It's got a little, well, you, you call it whatever kind of beat you want. <laughs> Gospel. <laughs> Thank you. 
Drummer hand. <laughs> I thought they would be tired of me by now. Okay, you brought the sunshine. Y'all heard that one? Okay, we did talk about that one, so sing along with me so you won't get tired of me. <laughs> All right, ready? One, two, three, four. <laughs> This is the one we talked about that crossed over on the reg uh, secular station. If you know it, sing it. Sharice made me do all that playing. I'm gonna ask him to do at least a three minute solo. Y'all wanna hear it?
Come on, give Twinkie Clark another hand. Can we give her another hand? The maestra. <laughs> okay, we're not gonna hold you too long. So a lot of people submitted questions um, with the registration. We're not gonna go through them all, but um, we will release answers to questions over time. But I do just wanna ask you one final question or group of questions, and then we'll let you. Group of questions. Yeah. <laughs> Well, actually two, two, because I promised Skip Gates, Professor Gates, who loves you dearly and sends his love, he wasn't able to be here tonight, but he wanted to know if you had a chance to see the documentary that you were featured in and what you thought about it. Did you get a chance? Yeah, I love you, Dr. Gates, and uh, the documentary that you did was just incredible. It was awesome. It talked about the roots of gospel on up to today, and you did make me explain um, what is my living in vain was, what, how, what kind of gospel music is that? And then I went on to tell them it's bluesy and jazzy mixed up, is my living in vain. I'll play a little bit of it. This is a, if you hear this or see this, Dr. Gates, this is especially for you, even though I already played it for you. I know you heard it before, Dr. Gates, but here it is again. excited about doing next what's, what's next? up next for you what can we expect yes well I'm hoping to do some work with uh, an artist uh, that's very well known but I can't say their name here today <laughs> y'all <laughs> laughing at me <laughs> and, and uh, we're supposed to do another tour have y'all heard about the tour yeah. uh, supposed to be another tour this coming fall yes, and I'm super, 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 super excited, especially if Damien and, and Dr. Barron are there. <laughs> and that's Howard University! <laughs> Y'all not acting excited. <laughs> that's because I'm here. <laughs> well, wait a minute. What's happening on November 15th? 2024. What's Thank that you, thing? Thank you, Damien. That's my 70th birthday celebration. Hey, hey, hey. So there's going to be an event, right? Yeah. There's going to be an event that you want everybody to come to, right? Yeah, please. I'm glad he uh, put, plugged that in. Uh, it's going to be November 15th in where? My hometown, Detroit, Michigan! Hey. The Big D. I know they're going to be there. I haven't asked them yet to do anything. I got to pay them probably. I, gotta pay them. <laughs> I better ask them how much they're going to charge me first. But these two, I would like for them to be two of my guests. And the rest of my surprise. If you do come, you will get a chance to hear uh, my sister. <laughs> Thank you so Don't forget, much. November. November. My 70th. Praise the Lord. Amen. November Birthday 15th. Birthday celebration in Detroit. Awesome. This was just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you to the amazing drummer, Brian Deuce. Thomas, Deuce. wasn't he amazing? And can we celebrate the one and only legendary Twinkie!
Clark. And everybody, can we celebrate the mastermind who put this together? Reverend Dr. Sharice Barron, Harvard University, stand up. And Damian Sneed, please, the genius, the genius. Have a good night, everybody. Sponsor, Harvard Divinity School, Harvard FAS Department of Music, Yamaha, and Hammond. Copyright 2024, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.